Do you feel that defining and managing Kubernetes resources with Helm or Customize is too tedious? Or do you think that you might need more power when managing Kubernetes resources? Are you tired of having hundreds or thousands of lines of YAMLs and templates and overlays? Or maybe you're annoyed having to have a bunch, a lot of Kubernetes boilerplate YAML, boilerplate code? If the answer to any of those questions is yes, then this might be just what you need. Otherwise, go away. There's nothing in this for you. We're going to explore JSONnet with Grafana Tanka. Now, JSONnet itself is one of those languages that some people love, others hate, and many do not even know that it exists. So let's explore what it is, how it works, why we might want to use it, and quite a few other things. To begin with, JSONnet is data templating language initially developed in Google or by Google, Google employees. And it is a superset of JSON. So it's JSON and then quite a few other things on top of it. And then all that is wrapped by Tanka, Grafana Tanka. And if you're wondering what Grafana Tanka is, well, it is a configuration utility on top of JSONnet. And if that's still confusing, don't worry because we are going to explore it in a hands-on demo very, very soon in a couple of moments. And before we do that, let me give you a quick potentially important note. You have to watch this video until the end, because in this case, in this particular video, I might have more thoughts about it and more pros and cons, and uh, I might have more to say than I usually do for any given project or product. So stick to the end. Pros and cons are going to be interesting, brutal maybe. We'll see. So let's see what I have right now in a project that I'm going to explore in this video. There is the environments directory, json file.json.net, some libraries and some vendor files. We're going to see what all those are in a second. For now, what matters, actually there are two things that matter. First of all, those files were created initially at least and then modified by me, but they were created with TK, which is Tanka CLI command line utility. So anyways, it is created with TK in it. So you can just execute that command, which I'm not going to do right now. But if you want to start a new project in JSON at later on, that's the command you want to execute. And the second important thing is that all the commands that I'm using, actually all the commands that I executed to set up for this video, and then the commands that I'm going to execute right now are in a gist, and the link to the gist is in the description. So if you want to follow along, you know how to do it. Let's start by evaluating the environment slash production directory and see what we'll get. And what we have is a very, very long JSON. And if you're familiar with Kubernetes, and I hope you are because, hey, it's 2022, you should recognize that these are Kubernetes definitions it's just that it's not in YAML, but in JSON. And the reason for that is because JSONnet natively outputs to JSON, but it also outputs to YAML, which is probably what you want to do. So let me execute tk apply command and see the same output, but in a different format. And uh, I got a namespace, I have a couple of services, two deployments and an ingress resource. Now, this is not really special in itself until you see how that output is generated and what's behind. What is the definition that I'm really using to generate that output? As you can expect, we can apply directly with Tanka those manifests with TK apply, and then whatever is defined, that output is transmitted to Cube API, and then those resources are created, updated, deleted. You know, it can do the same operations that you would do with uh, Helm or Customize or KubeCuttle, you know, apply, delete, and so on and so forth. That's the boring part. So let's jump into the definitions themselves, into JSONnet. But before we do, let's just be safe, be sure that all this works before we see how it works. So I'm going to type yes, 
and then the manifest will indeed be applied. And before I typed yes, you saw that there are some diffs and we can see what will happen if it happens, similar to Terraform uh, plan or something like that. Anyways, now it is really running in my cluster. It should be, uh, let me double check. I'm going to execute QCuttle, get and then ingresses and all, actually all and ingresses resources, which is a bit silly that ingress is not one of the old resources, but hey. And yes, everything is running, so we can move on. Now we can see JSONnet itself. Let's start with Kubernetes JSONnet file and see what's inside. This looks very similar to YAML or Helm templates. You can see that there are some Kubernetes resources. There is a deployment and others. There is nothing special about this so far. Actually, there are a couple of things special. First of all, this is JSON or JSONnet, and this is not YAML, which is kind of scary, isn't it, right? What does matter here is that this is a language. So some values, most of the values in this case are pure strings or integers, but some other values, JSON values, are actually variables. So unlike Helm templates where we are templating something, we are actually using data to fuel all this. The strange part, the truly strange part, unless you know how to program and you probably already do, is that actually there is a construct in each of those resources that says new and then brackets with the potential variables that we can pass. So those are really functions, right? So those are not the definitions that we are going to use directly. Those are the functions that we can invoke to generate what we really need. And there are variables in those functions like name, port, host, that we can use to customize, to pass the values into the data structure that is inside those functions. So what you see right now are not the definitions, but library, library, yes, libraries that I created so that I do not have to repeat myself. I have a definition or a function for the deployment, for a service, for ingress. I'm going easy on you. And now we're going to see how we can actually use those libraries or functions to fuel the definitions that we really, really, really want to have to define. So let's take a look at one of the two applications I have here, which is sillydemo.jsonnet. Over here, I'm defining sillydemo and saying, hey, it should be a result of a couple of functions. The first one is deployment, and that function has a couple of values that I'm passing into it. We have a name, which is sillydemo. We have an image that is yet another variable, and we'll see later where I'm defining that variable. The port is 8080. And finally, there is a JSON block, which defines the resources I want to have applied to my deployment. And the second one here is the service, which is a new instance of the service library or function. And it has a couple of values as well. There is the same name, the same port, and the name of the, not of the service, but of the redirection that we are going to use in a service, uh, the path is going to be called API. So given that I have a library that's Kubernetes JSONnet with the definitions of the resources and variations of resources that I might want to use, here I am instantiating some of those uh, functions, some of those resources or libraries, and the result is actually much shorter than what it would be if I would have to define the deployment and the service for this application separately from other applications. So there is less repetition already. Now, the important thing to note is that all those values that I'm passing can be almost any type of value. Yeah, we have a string, we have a vari value of a variable, and we have JSON, at least in within the deployment. And so we have very rich type of variables that we can pass. And uh, the special interesting one is actually JSON itself, uh, which is treated as data. That's important, not as text as in Helm. And then I have the second application called DevOps Toolkit.jsonnet, which is very similar to the other one. It's just that the values are somehow different because this application has some differences compared to the other one, but it does have a deployment. It does have a service. I'm not repeating. I'm just defining what is unique 
for the deployment and the service for each of those applications. And in this case, I'm adding ingress as well. Silly demo did not have ingress, not needed. This one does. There is still one more thing missing. We need to tie all those together, the libraries uh, I created and the definitions of applications and see what we'll get. So let's open main JSON at, or to be more precise, output it and see what's inside. First of all, I'm importing uh, the Kubernetes JSON at library and the two applications, which is silly demo and DevOps toolkit. And then there is config that defines the variables that are passed. The, the variables, actually not all the variables, because most of the variables are defined in the manifest JSON nets of the applications, but those are the variables, one actually, that is defined, that I expect to change over time, or at least change more frequently, which is uh, the image of each of the applications. And finally, there is the namespace itself. I could have put it somewhere else, but Hey, why not here? But really, it doesn't really matter how, where we put stuff. It's up to us to organize what works better. And I put the namespace there, assume it. And finally, there is one more file in this round of the demo, and that's spec.json. Essentially, it tells Tanka what is the server we want to work with, or to be more precise, what is the Kubernetes cluster we work with, and optional namespace. Now, unlike Helm, Tanka does not create the namespace, so I still needed uh, the definition of the namespace. And here I'm just saying, yes, use that namespace that you will create uh, in the other in the other manifest. And that's about it. Now, this might seem overwhelming because it is, but you start seeing benefits the more you grow, the bigger the scale, the bigger the number of resources and applications or whichever other resources we are managing, the more benefits we get from using a language, a specialized language, than uh, just going through templates with uh, YAML or customize or something like that. So for those two applications, uh, the benefits are not so great. But imagine reusing those libraries and definitions in tens or hundreds of applications and each of them having uh, two, three, five, ten, twenty different resources. The benefits at scale really shine much more than when we are managing just a couple of resources like in this demo. So you need to have imagination to see how this would work when it's big. Now, let me output Kubernetes JSONnet one more time. And the reason why I'm doing that is because I actually wasted my time or could have wasted my time defining the libraries myself. And I'm saying that I wasted time, actually I didn't, but let's say that I did because there are already libraries, ready to go libraries that we can use. And those libraries contain all the commonly used uh, Kubernetes resources and uh, those that are less commonly used because the community around them is growing. So let's explore ready to go libraries that we can use to replace the definitions that I have in Kubernetes JSON. Let's take a look at what I have in environment slash libs slash main.jsonnet. This is an example, modified example of what Grafana uses to define Prometheus and Grafana itself. When I say Grafana, I meant Grafana Labs uh, that uses for Prometheus and Grafana the tool, the platform. And here we are defining Prometheus that is a new deployment with the name and the number of replicas and the specification for containers, the containers part of the deployment itself that's in a separate library, which contains the name we want to give to Prometheus and the image that we want to use. And then that container instance is merged with the ports uh, so that we can define ports. Ports are not mandatory and in this case, those two are merged together. And that's interesting because that shows how we can combine different data structures into one structure, right? And finally, we are defining the service for Prometheus as well. Grafana follows the same pattern with the deployment and the service, except that this time service is mixed with yet another tiny library that uh, converts the service type uh, into node port. By default, it's cluster IP. Now, those libraries are already there because when I created, executed 
TK init command, it downloaded some commonly used libraries and then I could have extended with others. And there, actually, the one that uh, comes out of the box is already massive and contains all the commonly used uh, Kubernetes resources. You should go through them yourself. Uh, just open uh, Visual Studio Code or whatever you're using and navigate through the source code. It's uh, it's not easy. I was about to say easy. It's not easy, but with sufficient time, you really get to understand how all that works. It, it will take time. So there is a steep learning curve, but we'll talk about it in a second. Let's go to the next section to JSONnet and Tanka pros and cons, my favorite section. That's how I like to finish the videos. Now, uh, it's inevitable that we are, have to compare JSONnet with uh, commonly used tools, which is uh, Helm or Customize. If we compare it with Helm, uh, JSONnet supports so much more. There is patching, merging, it's a uh, data structure. It works with data. That's the biggest difference. Instead of templating YAML, which is a uh, data-based language anyways, and that really doesn't make sense. When you think about it, even though we are all used to Helm, it makes so much more sense to uh, combine Helm, which is a language, uh, with something that is based on data, which is JSONnet, which is yet another language, and so on and so forth. So it makes a lot of sense, uh, but only under certain conditions. We're going to get to that in a couple of moments. So let's start with what uh, JSONnet is not. It is not a templating engine. That's Helm. Helm takes pure text format, even though it's YAML, but it takes text and passes it through template. Uh, and uh, then we get some output, right? This is not it. This is not a templating engine. It is also not about overlays like customers. Customers just takes data structure, so that's better than then overlays them one against the other until we get the pyramid of something and then the output is what we want. It is a programming language, or to be more precise, data templating language. So it is a templating of sorts, but based on data, not on modifying clear text. So we are getting almost everything that a uh, real programming language gives us. That might not be obvious from the demo because demo was intended to be short uh, instead of full-blown tutorial from, for three hours or five hours or five days. But trust me, JSONnet is a programming language. It has variables, it has imports, overrides, functions, conditionals, everything. Now you might say Helm has many of those things. Yes, but it works against the text, not against data structures. Now, one question could be, hey, is this better or worse than using a real general purpose language like TypeScript or Go and maybe through Pulumi, right? And uh, in a way, it is because it is specialized instead of being general purpose language. But on the other hand, that means that there are things you need to learn. You need to dedicate time to figure it out while you might already know TypeScript or Go or whatever you're using. So Pulumi with the general purpose language might be easier to deal with, at least at the very beginning. But the result will not be the same because this is meant, JSONnet is meant to do this, to convert data and templates and functions, whatever, into output, which is JSON or YAML. A more important question is, actually, let's start with a statement. You have to have a complex setup for this to make sense. If it's not complex, if what you're doing is simple, then please use Helm or Customize. But if your setup is complex, then here's a question. Should we actually keep that complexity on the client side? And the, if the answer is yes, then JSONnet is really, really, really good. It doesn't look good until you spend some time with it. But once you figure it out, then it's really, really powerful and it helps a lot. But you might say, how about we move that complexity into clusters and create custom resource definitions? which is the path I like to take. And we can do that with the crossplane or, you know, I'm biased, I work directly with crossplane, but it could be Kubevela or one of many other frameworks to do that. And if we create custom resource definitions with operators, then usage of those CRDs 
is so simple that we do not need to manage such complexity on client side. Things are happening in clusters. And that's a preferable option for me. Create CRDs if your setup is complex. Create CRDs even if it's not complex. But if you don't want to do that, then yeah, this is a good option. So is it powerful? Definitely, yes, it's a very, very powerful language for what it does, what it's meant to do. Can it handle complex scenarios? Yes, it can. If your scenarios are complex and you want to stay on the client side, then yes, this is the thing. Is it easy to understand what's going on? Well, not really. That's one of the big downsides of uh, JSON. That you can easily get lost in the complexity that you will be creating or managing uh, through libraries or functions or this or that. So you are going to get lost at least initially. Is it better than general purpose languages like Pulumi or uh, Go or whatever you're using? It is. For this type of job, it is but beware of the learning curve. Can it remove the need for using Helm? It cannot for third-party apps. For third-party apps, Helm is unavoidable because all third-party applications are defined as Helm and only a fraction of them are available as ready-to-go JSON and the fraction is mostly what comes uh, from Grafana Labs. So do not expect to dive into JSON for third party applications, but do expect to do use it if you choose to uh, for your own apps. You will still need help. So that's what it is. But for your own applications, then yeah, this is uh, an option. So what are the pros and cons? Let's start with cons. It's a steep learning curve. Debugging, which I did not mention, can be very, very painful. Understanding what's going on can be complicated as well. And finally, it is aimed at ops people. So do not expect to create JSON ads all around and then give it to developers and say, go. That's not going to happen. It's just too complex for that. Uh, it is just enough complexity for you as ops who understands what you're doing, but do not expect to shift left with JSON ad. And uh, advantages, well, or pros, well, it's very powerful and uh, it really handles complexity very, very well, unless you want to move it to CRDs, but that's a separate subject. And the libraries are a really helpful feature. The ability to import libraries that already define certain things and then you just use those libraries is absolutely awesome. So all in all, summary, this is executive summary now. Use JSONet with Tanka if all of the followings are true. What you're defining is complex. You're not willing to move that complexity to custom resources and ops are managing everything. There is no shifting left. If those three are your thing and there's nothing wrong, and those are perfectly valid choices, then I suggest you try out JSONnet.